Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I thought I would answer, uh, it was a blog post that I had, had uh, looked at, and uh, the person had said that uh, Windows was more secure than Linux. And I wanted to kind of share with you my thoughts about that uh, right after this. So that's what I'm going to try to answer today is, what is the most secure operating system? Is it Linux? Is it Mac OS? Or is it Windows? Or none of the above? <laughs> and that's kind of what we're going to be looking at. But before we go there, I think what I want to do is um, kind of talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Firefox here. I'll leave that running, and we'll go in here. So, there is a there's a couple of websites. There is uh, there's one on CBE statistics, uh, and we can go in there. I think this is where the person got this information from, and and this is to allow you to look up. Uh, you know, based on a, a year or a type or a Linux or a distribution of it, you can look and you can see what the vulnerabilities are. And this is pulled from the NVD database, which contains all of the uh, computer vulnerability uh, uh, entries that are in there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up, let's see, maybe, uh, let's see, maybe I want... Vulnerabilities by date or top, yeah, let's see the top 50. Uh, maybe I want products instead. Okay, so let me, uh, let me blow this up a little bit so that you can see what we're looking at. I think this is what that person was looking at. They came into the site um, and immediately saw Debian Linux at the top of the list with 3,067 entries and went, oh my God, look at that. Now, where does Windows show up? Well, let's see. You got Windows Server 2008. That's obsolete. We won't look at that. Windows 7, that's gone. But here's Windows 10 down here with about 1,111 vulnerabilities. But what the person forgot to do was to click on this, was to go get the detail. And this is since 1999. And it shows the vulnerabilities, and it shows, you know, by type and... Here's the, the here's what it was that caused the vulnerability, and yeah, over the past few years, look, there's been a huge spike in 2018. It kind of fell down again in 2018. Yeah, there was some problems with the Linux kernel in 2018, no doubt about it. So let's look at the scores report and see, you know, how did how does all of these vulnerabilities kind of span uh, for a specific amount of time? Now I can put in. I can go back here to a calendar entry, and we can go all the way back. I think I can go all the way back. Let's go look at all of them. It might take a while <laughs> to get the information here. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe I should group this by year, huh? Okay. So uh, we have a distribution by year right here. So in 2019, we had this, these are the ratings of the vulnerabilities for 2019. And, and, and so, yeah, well, it's not really going back, is it? It's not really. Let's go back. Let's go back. Uh, let's not get ridiculous. Let's go back to 2016 here. And we'll say it's April 1st. Yeah, there we go. So we can kind of see over time, Debian is, now these these are less critical. These are kind of, you, you know, you got some misspellings on the page or maybe you're misdirecting, but it's not critical things that, are, that could cause someone to breach your system. As you get higher, and there's a breakdown, by the way, you can go look at it. There is a, a breakdown on the site about the ratings between 1 and 9, and actually 1 and 10. So 10 is the most vulnerable. Those are considered critical. 
uh, any any kind in up in this range that you see have to be fixed. Uh, the ones here are, are these are bad. And these are less serious. I mean, these are kind of, uh, yeah, we found some things. They're not really that critical. You have to be on site or you have to have special permission or you have to jump through a fiery hoop three or four times before you can get this to occur. But, yeah, so if you look at the distribution of it, uh, most of the ones for Linux, uh, by and large, uh, up here down in here in the four to five again there the four to five now there is some higher numbers here in the six to seven and seven to eight but yeah that's getting to up toward the critical and then this of course would be very critical anything above uh, nine to ten that would be very critical uh, and then of course there's some lesser ones down here but um, I think if we uh, I'm going to go back here for a minute back to our original uh, look and I want to look at it for the last year, and you can see that the 8 to 9, it's actually falling in the 7 to 8 average. These bubbles expand out depending upon the number of severity in, in the uh, bubble. So they, they get larger if you have larger numbers. And you can see it's right there. It's 35. But they didn't have any 8 to 9s. They had 4 that were in the critical range. Yes, that's bad. Uh, to have any in there is bad. But... Is, is that mean that Windows uh, is more secure than Linux? Well, I guess the way to answer that would be to go back to this. Let me go all the way back and go back and pick up Windows here. We'll do the scores report for the same period. And you'll notice that the bubble is larger in the 9 to 10, and Windows had 73. Uh, I didn't look at the score. I'll go back and look at it because I didn't look at the score. But this means the average is about 7.2 for the previous year. And, and let's see. We, yep, we need to drop back one more. We'll go see what Debian actually was. So 7.2 for... Microsoft Windows 6.9, you know, statistically speaking, that's not significant. <laughs> I'd say that, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could say that Debian Linux was slightly less uh, uh, vulnerable than Windows, but you can't make a declarative statement that says that Linux is better than Windows or Windows is better than Linux. Uh, it all depends on, this is really what matters, is the, the number of vulnerabilities that affect uh, the security of the system or what is the risk that that system has to be compromised. That's what we're worried about. And that's what CVEs are for, is to tell us, hey, we've got a bug here. It's critical. It needs to be fixed. Maybe I want to mitigate right now until I get a bug. Maybe I shut that service down. Maybe I move it to another, to some other system. But yeah, I mean, the other thing about Debian, and I've said this before, is you have to realize that Debian is used by the security professionals. That is the desktop they use. Uh, so <laughs> if you're going to find vulnerabilities, you'd think they would probably, I mean, I, I don't think they're like plumbers. I mean, I think if they're, they're going to test their systems first before they go out and test somebody else's. So, yeah, I mean, you're going to find uh, more criticality in, in more reports in Debian because that's where the security researchers live, is the systems they use. So, yeah, anyway, um, I'm not convinced that Windows is better than Linux from that. In fact, if I go down here, I'm sure I can find there's OpenSUSE, uh, they or open SUSE. I still call it SUSE from the old days, but it's uh, 918 total. Let's go take a look at them. No matching criteria. So no reported results for this year is what that means. And sure enough, they had reported results for last year, but haven't reported any, or excuse me, two years ago, but haven't reported any results yet for last year. Okay, that's fine. But let's look at the... Let's look at uh, let's look at that for the time period we can, and we only had a handful six point eight six point seven or seven point two six point not not a lot, and they were D, uh, uh, DOS overflows exec code, so data overflows basically, or DOS attacks causing an overflow. 
condition in the system, I think, is really more of it. There's XP, there's Vista. I'm probably not, I'm not probably actively reporting very many in that category anymore. But, uh, yeah, so that's nonsense. I mean, and, and that's what I want to talk about today is that, when I mean, when you see data like this, it's one of those things where it's, it's how to lie with statistics. I mean, right, you have to delve in to look and see what it really means and what, how it really stacks up. I mean, if you look at the next level is Android, and then they have the Linux kernel. Let's just see how bad the Linux kernel is. 6.3 overall. So, again, most of them are appearing in the 7 to 8 range. They had 50 uh, for the last year. And, and then 48. Now, uh, now probably should run this all the way back to 2018 because 2018 did have some really critical uh, bugs, which allowed, uh, uh, yeah, it had some very critical bugs in the uh, Linux kernel uh, that ca that caused some problems. And we all remember what those were. Or Spectre and Meltdown <laughs> was the biggest ones. So I'm going to uh, enough of that. Let's uh, let's jump back into what I want to talk about here, which is this and. So, how do, so here, here's some of the arguments that I've heard. I mean, Mac OS is more secure than Microsoft Windows. SE Linux makes Linux the most secure operating system. Yeah, so, I mean, I hear this all the time. Sometimes I hear that Microsoft Windows is more secure than Linux or Microsoft Windows is more secure than Mac OS. But, you know, the, the, the fact is those are just statements or opinions, but they're not backed up by any facts. So... Uh, how do we answer the question, which OS is the most secure objectively? I mean, if we're going to do this and we're really going to try to make an assessment, where, where should we go for the most secure OS? How do we do that? Well, this is my opinion on how to do that. So first thing I would look at is anti-malware. Uh, which systems offer anti-malware out of the box? Because, uh, I mean, it's not a, as big a problem as it used to be. But if your system is, if your system can be modified, then yeah, you could have all kinds of different attacks that are occurring in the entire system. I mean, this is kind of like a stepping stone to gain access to the system. You you first you break the security, you gain access, and then you start to exploit deeper and deeper into the system. So you ladder up until you get to the desired level of uh, penetration into the system that you're trying to achieve. So all of these areas are, are things that you want to use to attempt to do that, and malware is one of the vehicles that is used. Um, and that can come in many forms. It can come in email attachments. That can come in as a, a bad download from a site that you don't trust, or it could even come from a web browser-initiated pop-up or an executable through JavaScript or some other language or some other they trick you into downloading something that, they th that you think you might need. And that can happen on any operating system. But by and large, it's going to happen on Windows because uh, <laughs> we'll talk about some of the reasons why that happens. Uh, but anyway, Windows has a built-in AV uh, antivirus suite. It's reasonably good. It's based on YAR rules, and it, and, and it does uh, repudiation checks, not reputation checks. It's like the spell checker changed it back to, but it's re repudiation checks. It does not, however, do a good job of protecting from more advanced attacks, and we've seen that over and over again in the past few years. Now, Microsoft is continuing to improve it, uh, but you know, the, the, it's an es it's like uh, it's it's like an escalation. I do this, and the attackers do that. I do this, the attackers do that. It's an ever escalating uh, game of breaking the the uh, security to gain access to the system. Uh, Mac OS has uh, Gatekeeper, XProtect, Malware Removal Tool. They also have the T2 chip. There's a number of other things they are doing uh, in the uh, modern chip, uh, modern uh, OSs, but uh, the T2 chip, obviously, that is hardware-based. Uh, they, do, uh, they do offer some sandboxing, and we'll talk about that a bit. But, again, <laughs> you, can, you can fool that. I mean, it, it, those, those particular things are good at protecting the applications that Apple installs, but it's not good at protecting applications that you install from other sources. So if you're deploying applications on Mac OS from the App Store, yeah, those three things will work very well for that. But if you're deploying things from the outside, you're downloading code and you're executing and you're circumventing the gatekeeper, which is that thing that asks you whether or not you want to install third-party uh, software. If you circumvent that, then you're offering a, va a valid uh, pathway for malware to gain access and gain a hold on your system. Simple as that. So, 
Those things are not foolproof. Uh, Linux does not provide any anti-malware or software installed by default. Yes, it has lots of utilities, lots of stuff you can put out there, but I don't know of any distro other than probably the security ones, like uh, Tails and some of the others, like Cubes, OS, uh, that actually install any kind of malware scanners or anything like that, or any kind of tools and utilities that will do that. Yes, there are distros that will do that. Uh, if you uh, install Parrot, Parrot installs sandboxes, <clears throat> for example. So, yeah, there, but again, as a rule, the general workstations and the distros for the workstation, including some servers, don't have any tools readily available when out of the box when you install it. So that's all I'm saying. Uh, as far as uh, uh, different security features, there's also sandboxing or trust isolation. Uh, that protects the rest of your software from untrusted processes. In other words, it prevents other applications from reading and writing files that are owned by your app. It basically keeps them in their own pen, and they can see what they're doing, but they can't see anything else that's going on in the system. It's important, particularly for cloud environments, where you have multiple customers on the machine and you're trying to segregate and prevent other customers from gaining access to code and applications and data on the other systems. But it also prevents uh, applications from communicating with one another over in the system. So um, that is a sandbox is truly a, 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 well, it's not a fortress environment, but it's a pinned environment. In other words, it's trying to hem the application in. Now, uh, Unix and Linux have always had somewhat of a rudimentary uh, uh, sandbox between the user land and the system land. That's why it was created. Uh, but it, it didn't go far enough, and, and we also need it now between the applications because of the complexity of the apps. And I'll talk more about that at the end. There's a lot more to that story than just cloud. Uh, there are implications even for your workstation. Windows and Mac OS both, uh, both have sandbox apps that are available from their app stores. So in other words, what I'm saying here is you don't have to download anything. If you're downloading applications from the Apple App Store or the Microsoft App Store, you're getting a sandbox of sorts. Now, I'm not going to debate the relative merits between one or the other. The point is that they're attempting to contain the applications from each other. Uh, and but there's, but neither one of them provides any any mechanism to stop apps from running outside of the sandbox. I mean, I don't have to deploy applications that I install from the App Store. And in fact, I don't think very many uh, Windows people do that. Do you? I mean, I mean, if you're using Microsoft Windows, do you use the App Store a lot? Um, and I, there are apps that aren't offered in the Mac OS uh, App Store that you have to go external to get, and those will not be in contained environments. They won't be inside the sandbox. Uh, Linux, of course, has many different sandboxing options. Uh, Linux and uh, SE Linux and uh, App Armor are very good at what they do. There's also, I mean, you can go Docker, you can go L LXD and LXC, as I have shown in the past. I mean, those are sandboxes. You can go jails. You can, I mean, any of those kinds of things you can use to sandbox. Uh, but... And then the other thing is that some distributions are trying to go to an immutable OS, I don't know how well that's really going to work out. I mean, the world is mutable. I mean, everything changes. I mean, saying that the OS is immutable isn't really true either. You you can you can certainly change it, and you can do that by downloading something and rebooting the machine as long as you follow, like in the case of Fedora, as long as you follow the OS tree and the application you want to install is available on the OS tree, uh, you can install it, reboot the system, and you've just mutated the system. So... Uh, immutable is kind of a myth. It's a nice idea, but it's kind of a myth. Uh, uh, so yeah, but the, you know the idea behind it is you're trying to prevent uh, un, you know un, unauthorized modifications to the configurations, the applications, and the libraries. It's really what you're trying to do there. How well that's going to work out in the future, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball that works anymore. It broke, but uh, I don't know. So I guess we'll just wait and find out. The other feature is code signing. Code signing has uh, been around on Linux a long, long time. 
Uh, it's, it's being used also. Uh, it basically, that's an authentication technology that ensures that the application or processors came from a, a, a trusted source. It's somebody that's registered. It's somebody that's known. They have an address. They have a belly button. You can punch. You can push on it if you have a problem. Uh, also, it makes sure it also gives some level of uh, integrity to the application that's included inside the package that hasn't been modified since it was created. So, and that doesn't mean now what's going on today is, as you saw a couple of days ago, that, uh, uh, and this has been going on for the last few years, is that the, that the stealing the certificate, <laughs> the, the uh, private certificate, allows you to impersonate that uh, particular vendor, and then you can install whatever you want, pass your malware version of the software on, and get everybody to update, and voila, your, your uh, code is now infected. <laughs> but it's easily defeated, so it's not it's not foolproof. So Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux all have code signing to some degree. It's possible, however, to install unsigned applications on all three of these platforms. I mean, you don't have to install applications through trusted resources. I could go get an RPM library. I can bring it down. I can just run, you know, I can just run run, run against it with uh, DNF or YUM. Or if I'm on uh, a Debian-based system, I can do the same thing with APT or with the R, with the uh, D package uh, utility. It doesn't check. Doesn't care <laughs> what that what that application is. Or I could just bring it down in source code, compile it, and the mal. If I didn't check the source code over, then the malware gets installed. But anyway, um, Mac, uh, Windows and, and uh, Mac OS both check code signatures on the first execution. So they not only check the code signatures to make sure that it's valid to download, they also check the first time the code executes. They don't check it subsequently unless the code is modified. The date changes or the size changes or the signature is different. And then they'll reprompt you for trust. Linux distributions... Like Debian have, have have used code signatures on download for a long time, but they do not do uh, checks on the first execution as a rule. I don't. I'm not aware of any offhand that do that. Maybe you guys know, um, but I don't know of any that do that uh, where it actually validates the signature. Now, uh, I'm talking about standard packages here, and I'm not talking about Snaps, and I'm not talking about uh, Lexi, and I'm not talking about any of those or Docker or any of those ways of deploying applications. I know those do. Uh, the code signing is generally regarded as a security measure, which can be easily defeated. I mean, if I get the if I get your keys, I can be you. Simple as that. Um, or if I just simply give some software that doesn't go through that pathway, I, I can get it on the system as well. So yeah, not not exactly perfect, is it? Uh, an operating system today should have a me mechanism to ensure the configuration and the data and the applications can't be changed unless it's explicitly granted to the application by the operating system. That has been a long-standing tenet in Unix and Linux for the longest time. It's not applied evenly, and it's not always applied across the board. There are ways to circumvent that. So we don't really have a complete answer today. There's, uh, and that means that we need to protect memory, cache, uh, add-on devices such as the memory and GPU cards or network cards or disk, anywhere there's memory. Uh, that needs to be flushed because anytime you have an application that leaves and doesn't clean up after itself, that data can be exfiltrated. So yeah, no, no OS provides a complete answer here as, as far as I know. It's getting better. Uh, I'll probably do some, uh, some uh, there is some things that are going on in the Linux kernel in support of RISC-V. RISC-V, um, the open source platform for CPUs, is bringing to Linux, and, and, and this code is, has been in there for a while, uh, but they are bringing it to Linux, a multi-level uh, trust uh, mechanism where each application that runs has its own level of trust instead of a, a, a single pool that's shared uh, and then is granted trust individually and then you use sandboxing to segregate it, they're actually creating uh, levels of trust within the Linux kernel, which will be interesting to see how well that works and, and what kind of a solution that actually will, will become ultimately. So let's look at some of the myths and the bunk <laughs> that I've heard, uh, and I'm sure you've heard these too. Windows is the least secure because of its installed base. In other words, 
uh, because there are more workstations out there, it makes it e- makes it easier for me to hit more systems by writing code for Windows. So it's least secure because it's mostly attacked more frequently. No doubt, uh, Windows is targeted more than any other operating system. And writing any malware for Windows means it'll run on 80% of the workstations. But you can also reverse that argument and you can say that, well, Microsoft has suffered a lot of attacks over the past 20 years and beyond. And even back even before that, they have more experience in defending against them than any other vendor. So you can easily reverse that because they do have more experience in, in fighting off attacks because of the prevalence that they have in the market. But the, the real point here is that the OS doesn't provide security. They never have. They never will. They, they offer, uh, well, we'll talk about that at the end. They, but the, it's the endpoint software that really surprises, it provides the security. It's the policies of your organization and the people who maintain the systems. They're the ones that provide the security, not the operating system. Operating systems are, well, they talk about security, but they don't really, they don't really uh, provide it. Because anytime you plug a system in and plug it into a network, It's no longer secure, not in my book, (laughs) anyway. uh, Linux. Linux is the most secure because it's open source. I've heard this a lot of times from a lot of people. Uh, Yeah, that does have some merit, but it also has a flaw. So, I mean, usually even in the, the, the source code takes a long time to review. I don't know if you guys have ever sat down and actually done security audit on code reviews, but it takes months to get through it. Uh, to make sure that, you know, that, and you're looking for things like, uh, can I overflow this buffer that's, you know, it, and is the buffer too big? Can I stick a SQL statement in the middle of it? You know, it's all that kind of nonsense that you're looking for. So it takes one to two years to find the, a security flaw in a new software version. That's just generally an average. And that doesn't matter if it's the kernel or if it's a library or it's an application because they're all, I mean, you have, if you look at an application, maybe the application itself only has 10,000 lines of code, but it might be deploying 15 different libraries and those in turn have 5,000 lines of code each. So you're looking at an awful lot of code that you have to go and review. And even libraries have dependencies on libraries. So yeah, you can end up chaining up and chaining out and, and it'll become, look like a family tree. So, um, we saw this in 2006 with Heartbleed on Linux, uh, and that bug was created in the Linux kernel in 2004, and nobody caught it until the exploit surfaced in 2006. And then it was like, oh no, uh, we got a problem, we got to go find out what happened. So again, the point here is the OS doesn't provide the security, it's the endpoint software and the people that are working on the system and also the policies of the organization. So this one, I like this one. Mac OS is the most secure operating system because of Apple. Apple's generally considered to be a closed OS. And, and, and I think this goes back to the obfuscation is security. Obvi- that's nonsense. Obfuscation is not security. And if people think that because it's closed source, that makes it more secure, that's complete bunk. Uh, but anyway, Gatekeeper, Xprotect, and MRT, the malware ret- removal tool are rudimentary tools that protect uh, that do not protect the OS from all applications. In fact, I could go out and install, it, it, will, it will protect Safari, but if I install Google uh, Chrome or I install Firefox, that, that uh, none of those three things protect it, <laughs> protect that particular uh, execution. So, and again, um, the OS doesn't provide the security. It's, it's back to my, what I, and the mantra is endpoint software, people, and policies. That's what provides the security. Uh, at least in my experience. Uh, Linux is the most secure because it's highly configurable. Well, I won't argue that SE Linux and App Armor are, are, are not good tools. They most certainly are. They both do very, very well at what they do. In fact, you can lock down your system so tight, you won't even be able to get into it yourself. So yeah, you definitely can lock. You can you can use those two utilities, and you can lock yourself right out of the system if you want to. Uh, they're very good, uh, but you know I don't think that's the goal. Uh, we we have to remove we have to remove blocks to introduce points. Anytime we have to remove blocks to get allow the flow of data, we're introducing points of vulnerability. So. Yeah, I've been there, done that, got the achievement award for uh, blocking myself out of the system with uh, both SE Linux and App Armor. It is not hard to do. It just takes one error um, to do it. So I think there was a quote from Dennis. I think it was Dennis Ritchie who said this a long time ago. 
when uh, they started putting uh, uh, controls, security controls into Unix, he said, Unix security is so good, we have to blow huge holes into it just to get it to run right. And it's, I, that's not the exact quote that he said, but it's something like that. Uh, and what he meant by that was, yeah, we can lock the system down to the point where nothing works. Uh, <laughs> and then we have to slowly open it up again in order for to get data to flow. And that's the same principle of a firewall. If I close it all down, nothing's going to flow out of the system at all. And so, yeah, you have to gradually open things up to allow data to come, to start to flow again. So, yeah, again, no no OS is going to protect you. It, that it, if you're counting on the OS to be your 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 protector and security, you're looking at the wrong things. Yeah, again, it's the policies endpoint and the people that are maintaining the system. They're the ones that do provide the security. You never want to boast that your system is secure. That's nonsense. No system is secure <laughs> unless it's turned off. Uh, surrounded by copper wire in a basement and surrounded by about five feet of lead. Uh, and, and there is no power lines going into it, no internet connections, no, le- le- no uh, network connections, no phone lines, nothing going into it. That's the only time you have a secure system. And, uh, and maybe even then you could probably read data out of it. So my security summary for 2020. Uh, so what have I told you? Security is futile, prepared to be assimilated? No, not, not, not at all. Uh, this isn't the Borg. Um, security has always been about admitting that you can't keep a system secure, uh, but you have to mitigate the risk. You know that, there, that, that there's going to be a vulnerability somewhere in the code because you can't possibly find it all. It's just like testing software. The more complex the software is, the less of the code you test because you are, you have a certain amount of money to spend in order to test the thing. And then when it comes out, sure enough, somebody's going to discover that something's broken and it creates a vulnerability. That happens. That's inevitable, especially in complex code. But what you want to mitigate is assuming that, that someone can get access, can they get the data? Can they get any kind of that configuration? Can they find out about my network? Can they they join up? Can they get the can they play man in the middle and be able to grab data as it flows over my network? That's what that's what the risk is. What do you do about you don't assume that they can't get in, you assume they did get in and that what you did to protect your data once they did. So yeah, you harden the OS the best you can with the money you have and the resources you have to do it with. It's sort of like uh, security is kind of a business function, and, and you have to kind of treat it that way. It's like insurance. How much can you uh, afford to risk, and what are you willing to pay for? So, And, and that's the level of, that you can only get uh, through security, and that's all I wanted to tell you today. So uh, if you have... Um, yeah, so... I mean, if you have different ideas about it, I, I know I've covered pieces of this topic before, but this topic came up again that somebody said that Windows was more secure than Linux. And I've heard it the opposite way. Linux is more secure. I mean, I've heard that over and over again. The truth is, no, none of them are. Sorry, none of them are. Uh, but uh, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed this topic today. Uh, if you did, please like and subscribe. And hey, if you've got a different opinion, I always am happy to hear from you. Uh, please leave one below. And if you like the video, please res- <laughs> please leave a comment as well. always enjoy reading those and replying to them as well. Hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.